Alex Gill with On Demand Location, and we're here at OhioCon 2012 with Trish Ledoux. Um, for those of you who don't know you, what was it like getting started in the anime and manga industry? <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, gosh, I guess when we got started, it was before there was an anime and manga industry, so we would always, you know, call it the industry, hopefully with quotes around it, because it was an industry. Yeah, of course it is now, but it wasn't then. Um, we started because we were fans, and we wanted to be a part of what we loved and what we enjoyed so much. And I first got exposed to it, well, you know, not going too far back, watching um, Astro Boy and stuff. I didn't know that was Japanese. Speed Racer didn't know it was Japanese. Star Blazers, I finally knew, was Japanese. So I got an interest in it. I, went, I was going to um, gaming conventions then, you know, D&D stuff. And they had an anime room. And I watched a lot of anime then, and I got very interested. And I met some people who just happened to be putting together an anime magazine in Berkeley. And that was Animag. And I hooked up with those people, and I became the editor as of the third issue, I think it was. And that's how I started. And I went on to other things from there, but that was my first official start, was working as an editor at Animag, and that's where I met my now husband, Toshi. We've been together for 24 years, <laughs> working together the whole time. Awesome. Um, it says that you are a writer and an ADR. What is it like working in that sector of the industry? Okay. Well, to be completely fair, um, I wish that I could write fictional novels. I love zombies, for example. I'm just crazed about it. I've read nothing but zombie and zombie apocalypse books for the past year. If you name it, I've read it. I know it. I know everything about it. Um, I wish I could write a zombie novel. I can't. But what I can do, for whatever reason, I have this unique combination of abilities. Having studied Japanese and, and lived in Japan and, of course, you know, working actively in the field, um, I am able to watch the Japanese and understand what they're saying while also watching the mouths and then thinking, what is it that I want them to say? And what I want them to say in an English version of something is not what they are literally saying, because what they are literally saying is a translation. It's not the same, right? It's a shadow of what it is that they're saying. So it's the writer's job to interpret what it is that you think they should be saying. I always use the analogy of the, the babel fish from Hitchhikers. You know, you put, <laughs> you get it in and you get the context, you get the idiom, you get the colloquialisms. I think an English script should have the colloquialisms. Yeah. Because there is a lot of implied meaning Always. in the dialogue yeah. in, in Japanese, and there's a lot of that that I feel can get lost in English audiences. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's a question of uh, uh, how literal do you want to have it? I mean, I think fans in general, generally speaking, want to have it as literally as possible because they want the Babelfish experience. They want to feel as though they're watching the anime in Japanese and yet somehow are magically getting the full import and uh, context of it. Well, that's never going to happen unless you're speaking Japanese. And even with me with a degree in Japanese and working professionally as a translator, my Japanese, there are certain areas where I have huge holes. I can't talk about politics. I can't talk about science. I just don't have that vocabulary. What I do have is you know, anime and manga vocabulary, as a lot of us <laughs> do. So I'm very good at listening to something like, say, a Ronda episode in Japanese, interpreting what they say, watching the mouth, that's where the technical skill comes in, deciding how it is I want it to end up to sound, and then I write the words to fit that. Now, what I want them to say isn't always what I can make them say, because one, what they're saying in Japanese has to be paramount, but two, it also has to be natural to fit in the mouths. We were talking earlier at a panel today about um, Ranma, and I came up with a lot of the English names for the Japanese moves, for example, um, okay, let's not even go to Rama, let's go to Inuyasha. And Inuyasha has something called a Sankon Teso, and we ended up calling it Iron River Soul Stealer. And you could say one translation of Sankon Teso would be Blades of Steel. That's one way of translating it. There's lots of different ways. But how am I going to make Sankon Teso, how am I going to make that into Blades of Steel? <laughs> Blades of Steel! <laughs> so I necessarily had to change it, make it longer, and make so the open part, Sangong Teso, it had to fit in there, Iron Reaver, Soul Stealer, it just fit. And I liked it, and it was a little alliterative, so I stuck with it. So it's a compromise, always. There's what you want to write, and then there's what you have to write. And then you've got all the um, issues of working with the actor and working with the director. Well, we were always very fortunate working at Viz when I was recording there and writing and producing. Um, that we were able to go and sit in a studio for all the recordings. So if there's something in there that wasn't meant to be in there, I have to take complete responsibility for it because I was there and I could have said, no, redo it, and I often did. By the same token, if there's something that's in there that's good, I had a little bit of something to do with it because I said, okay, let's go with that. Um, there are also choices that you make, and I'm sorry if I'm getting too far off topic. 
Okay, there's <laughs> <laughs> choices you make creatively on what you want to do in a series. And sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's a bad idea, sometimes it's a good idea, but you have to pay a lot for it. My good idea was I really felt it was important to have the Japanese names be the same. I've never liked it when they change the names of the Japanese characters because even though um, they're speaking English, you know, it's a conceit somehow that we're all pretending that we're hearing in English what it is they're originally saying in Japanese. So in order to keep that uh, the illusion, I'd like to keep the Japanese names, but sometimes the Japanese names are so difficult that even people who speak Japanese can't really say them correctly all the time, never mind an actor who speaks no Japanese whatsoever. Like in, in Ranma, um, there's Ryoga. Now that's a Ryo, now that's a R sound in Japanese, and you've heard the well-known joke about the, the fly lice, right? Yeah. That comes from the Asian tongue pronouncing an L kind of like an R and an R kind of like an L. It's halfway in between. It's not lice, it's not rice, it's lice. It's halfway in between. So it's not ryoga, it's ryoga. And I speak Japanese and I have a hard time busting out that sound. At ryo, perfectly, right? Yeah. Try getting the actors to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly, constantly, no, say it again like this, no, say it again like this, no, say it again like this. So sometimes we have to compromise and we'll get Ryoga, which is what we settled on. And the fans, of course, come up to me, why did you get his name wrong? I said, can you say it? <laughs> if they can say it correctly, then I would give them all due credit and respect, but most of the time people about the name of Kiriko Cuvier, who is yeah. the main character of the series, yeah. and he says, there's, like, I have to tell the people that are, you know, doing this that, you know, there's a lot of people that do pronounce it wrong even when they're, you know, Working on Absolutely. that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm aware of some of that. Yeah. Um, what is the name of the main character in the Little Alchemist? Uh, it's Miss A something, Alfred Edward. Alphonse. Edward. Edward. Yeah. What's his last name? Edward. Edward Elric. Toshi would say to them, okay, imagine going to Japan and sitting in a recording studio, and okay, these are Japanese actors, except they're going to record in English dub. Okay, you're going to say the lines in English. Okay, Japanese speaking actors, say Edward Elric. What is it again? Elric. Edward Elric. They will say, no, say it, Edward. Eduardo, no, say it, Edward, Eduardo. <laughs> you make the accommodation. There was this one show that we did that I produced that was called Project Arms, and actually Amanda Winley wrote the scripts for it. Brilliant, brilliant work, amazing. Some of the best ADR work ever. So she wrote the scripts for me this case instead of me being the ADR writer. And um, the main character in that series, his name was Dio Takatsuki. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to get the English-speaking actors? Dio, Ryo, no, Dio, Ryo, Takatsuki. What? <laughs> so my point being, you can make some creative choices as a writer, but you have to be willing to put in the work to keep that defended because if I did not go out for every single one of the recordings, then that name would have slid down. I mean, sometimes it slid even when I was there. It's a constant fight, but I think in the end it was worth it creatively. Yeah. And you also work with your husband, uh, Toshi, on a lot of these projects. Yeah. So what, what kind of uh, environment is it like uh, working with your spouse mm. in the automated industry? Mm. Well, to be honest, I don't really know what it's like to work without him because we have always worked together. Um, ever since I first met him back in Berkeley at, at Animag in, oh my gosh, 86, 88, I can't remember one of those two. It must have been 88 when we met. Um, he would tell me what was kind of going on, and I was still in school for Japanese then. And then I'd get an idea, and I'd say, well, is it like this? And he'd say yes and no, more like this. So his work informed my work, and I like to think that my views on how things should be said in English informed his work as well. So we've been a very solid creative team. For um, We'll have been together next month. As of next month, we'll have been together for 24 years. And we've worked together in anime and manga the entire time. So what was it like to work with him? I don't know. Maybe the question is, what is it like to work without him? I, I literally don't know. We've been lucky enough to um, not only work together as freelancers, like when we were working on the magazine, but we were at Viz for, I was at Viz for 13 years, and Toshi was there the same amount of time. So you know, we had desks, like here was my desk, there was his desk. And you would think you'd get completely sick of seeing each other, and maybe sometimes we got a little tired and wanted to go home and retreat into our own worlds. But by and large, I can't even imagine what it would be like to do anything in anime and manga without him. It's <laughs> wonderful to hear, and in advance, happy anniversary to you both. <laughs> um, it also says that you've uh, worked on a manga, Negima, mm -hmm. for uh, Delray Comics. Yeah. Can you share with us your experience? Well, I can't remember right off the top of my head uh, which were the, the, the volume that we started with and the volume that we ended with, and I'm sure people on the internet can easily find that for me, so I won't worry about it. Um, we took it over because the editorial team was 
at Delray was looking for something maybe a little closer to um, what was going on in the Japanese. So, you know, when you're doing an adaptation, it's so possible, as I was saying before, to make your choices how close are you going to stay, how far away are you going to get away. Sometimes it gets so far away that it, it could be a perfectly interesting, legitimate thing, but it's gotten too far away, maybe for people who are familiar with the Japanese, because they want it to be as close as possible to that. So the editorial team maybe wanted it to come back a little bit closer to that. And, you know, Toshi and I, just because of our experience, I think we're a good fit there. And so when we started it up again, we tried to get back to what some of the Japanese translations were, that they had maybe been changed and names had been um, misunderstood. For example, I'm remembering, this was a, a little while ago, there was a character called the, the Sazan Masta, the Sazan. And it, there's two ways you can translate that or interpret it. One could be Sazan, could be Southern, Sazan, he's from the South, right? Or Thousand, 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 so is it the thousand master or is it the southern master? So you have to make your decision. You try and stick with it. You try and keep it consistent. And that's what we tried to do. We tried to bring out the voices of the characters as we saw them. Uh, we did not watch the anime. Uh, we st stuck exclusively with the manga, and we tried to develop the voices as they felt to us coming out in it. Uh, Negima is a very unusual series. I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of Akamatsu Ken before Negima. Um, some of the work that he had done didn't really appeal to me that much, but Negima, I think, is um, very multifaceted, and it's very rich. There's a lot of detail, character, background. I understand that Akamatsu Ken works with uh, several assistants, some of whom have backgrounds in you know, classical Greek. So he would write things in Greek in his footnotes, and then Toshi had to translate them. <laughs> He'd also use a lot of ancient Japanese. And, you know, people hear, oh, Trish, you speak Japanese. Here are the readers. I, I can't read that. That's like asking me to read Chaucerian English without having had a class in it, you know. Uh, it's the same thing. If you speak contemporary Japanese, you don't necessarily read ancient unless you're a scholar. So Akamatsu would put in lots of this stuff. So the footnotes, I think, of all the things we've worked on over the years were especially detailed and complicated. And we put so much work into them that I think they were very um, entertaining and informative for the fans of the series to read. Yeah. Um, in your time in the anime industry, um, what is the biggest change you have seen take place? Mm, there's a lot of changes. It's difficult to say. I mean, as I said, there was no industry <laughs> in the beginning, and now there is no industry left either. But I do think um, maybe there's a change. Uh, in the beginning, we, I have talked about this in another panel, there would be a time when literally if there were one woman for every 50 fans, that was a lot. And that's what it was like when I first started. And the median age was definitely early, mid-20s and older, you know, exclusively male, really, for the most part. And you go to a panel now, you just go out there on the floor. I mean, if it's not gender parity, it's got to be close enough to it. It's got to be a 50-50. You know, in the age range, it's skewed so much younger. And a lot of people say that's because of the television influence. It's because the so-called, uh, this came from an Anne America letter that someone wrote in at one point, they quote, clueless 13-year-olds wearing Sailor Moon t-shirts at Suncoast. <laughs> and there was a lot of anger among the existing fandom at that, because there was the sense that maybe the fandom was being co-opted. You know, the whole, I was into that group before they got famous kind of a thing, and then yeah. it's less fun afterward. Anime fans, I think, to a large extent, share that. It's, it's always been kind of a very insular fandom. It's always been a handshake fandom. You know, you had to know somebody to get in. It's like, hi, this is my friend and my friend, and we're in Cal Animage, and we're sitting in a giant room, and somebody up in the front is interpreting what they think they're saying in Macross, but we're not really sure, and we're all being very quiet and listening because we've never seen it before, and um, you could get tapes if you knew somebody who knew somebody, and then you'd send them blank VHSs, and they'd copy you the stuff and send it back to you, but they'd be copies of copies of copies of copies, so you'd have this nth generation, you know, and you'd have maybe something on the screen, and you'd think maybe it's a Gundam, you couldn't really hazard a guess as to what model it was. You just knew that maybe yeah. it was a or maybe it was a Valkyrie. I don't know. <laughs> so fandom was like that in the beginning. It was all about knowing somebody. And in, in, in a sense, you almost felt a sort of validation by being in it. It gave you some sort of identity, some sort of way of saying there's this club to which I belong that other people don't know about. That still lingers in the fandom today. Even with the young kids that we see going around with their costumes, the girls, the, the clueless 13-year-olds, um, they know something that the other people at this hotel do not. Other people at this hotel do not. Like the guys who will sit in the bar and they'll just kind of look at these kids and like, what the, what? <laughs> We're clued into something that's cool and we know something that a lot of people uh, don't know. And even in this day and age of when anybody just drops, oh, anime this, anime that, the mainstream understanding and expectation of anime is nothing like really what it is if you've been in it for a while. I mean, what do you think? As, how long have you been in the fandom yourself? Uh, 
that's yeah. already happening. Um, as someone who was in the industry before it was an industry and now that it no longer uh, it still is, but is it what it was? No. Yeah. Um, I could beat my chest and tear up my hair and, and say, oh, it's all the fault of this, it's all the fault of that. But the fact is, it changed, you know, adapt or die. It, it had to happen with, with the RIAA, it had to happen with the film industry. The paradigm has shifted, adapt or die. So anime industry has to be look like that as well. And I would like to echo some comments made by my husband earlier. If you do love the fandom, you have to support the fandom or it's going to change to where you don't recognize it anymore. And it might not be what you want it to be. Um, I have a Kindle, and I'll tell you why this is relevant. <laughs> I'm a book lover. I've always been a book lover. I have a degree in English. I teach English. I teach Japanese at various times. Um, I love a physical book. I love the smell of a book. I like putting it up in a bookshelf. That being said, my husband gave me a Kindle for Christmas one year, and he said, Trish, you're going to love this. I said, no, I'm not. I like books. No, no, really. You're going to like this. Okay. I have dozens and dozens and dozens of novels on my Kindle. I can bring it with me anywhere. I can read it in bed. I can put it down. It remembers where I read. It's like carrying a novel stack this big, even more room full of books I can fit on my Kindle. Why is this relevant? Well, I go to Borders. I go to Barnes & Noble, Borders especially. I would go in, I'd take a look at all the books, and I'd look at the covers and stuff, and I'd say, that looks like an interesting <laughs> novel. So I'd go on to Amazon, and I would get it from my Kindle. Was that helping Borders? No. So in extension, I am partially, personally responsible for Borders going out of business. Me, a book lover, somehow I have been responsible for Borders no longer being in business. I have. I'll admit it. Every time I went into Borders and looked at the physical books and then went home and bought them from Amazon anyway, I'm culpable. Same thing is maybe true for fandom, too. You know, they, they hear about the shows, they go on the internet, they download it. Well, they've got the show, they've got the direct access, they cut out the middleman, but it's changed the playing field, it's changed the rules now. So if I wanted borders to still exist as they are, I should not have been getting it on the Kindle, right? I don't know, I'll leave further extrapolation <laughs> on that subject. Yeah, well, I used to work at Barnes & Noble, so I feel, I feel partially responsible also. <laughs> I know it's partially my fault, I yeah. know it. I know, and yet, would I change it? I like my Kindle. Yeah. It's how I want my content delivered. And I think anime fans are telling us the same thing. Yeah. They're telling us we don't want to go and buy VHS tapes anymore. Yeah. We don't want to go and buy laser disc box sets. We don't want to go and buy DVDs or Blu-rays. You know, we want to be able to queue up Netflix and watch our shows now. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> All right. um, now it says that you've also done some voice acting. What has your experience been like <laughs> voice acting? Well, I think everybody thinks that they can voice act. <laughs> I'll just get that right out there. I've never met a fan who didn't think that somehow they could maybe do some voice acting. <laughs> and I was no different. I thought, well, gosh, I guess I'd be a good voice actor. You know, I can understand the Japanese. I can get the pronunciations more or less yoga. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I, I did some stuff for what was then LA Renditions, LA Hero, US Renditions, LA Hero. Um, it went through the various changes. I was in um, Macross 2. I played the, the idol singer Wendy Ryder. I had like maybe three lines and I did some other stuff and I have to tell you in every case my one takeaway experience is that it's way harder than it looks. It's incredibly difficult and before you can be anything else you have to be an actor first and I never was and I never will be and I have no talent at it. So I am grateful for having done the few voice roles that I did. I did Princess Common Outlanders. That was the first like full you know main role that I had the first and last and I'm really glad that I did it because it gave me a tremendous respect for the actors. When we were recording, it was, you know, back when, when you would sit in this little closet that somebody had converted and they put the egg crate up around all the walls and they had a little TV monitor up in the corner and they did a time code bird on the bottom and you would stand there at the mic and you would literally count down three, two, one, and then you would say it and you would try and meet, meet the band that was on the bottom, which is how up until recently they did it in Japan as well. That is fabulously difficult. I mean, the technical expertise needed to do that, in addition to remembering your line, in addition to remembering to act, to not pop your peas and throw spit, technical aspect, enunciating, all of that, too difficult for the likes of me. But very glad that I did it. Very glad, because I have such respect for voice actors. I really do. It's tremendously difficult. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is your first time at OhioCon. How's it been? It's been interesting. It's been different. Um, you would think that after 20 plus years of going to anime conventions, I will have seen it all. But I haven't. The fandom is changing. We were talking before about the biggest change in the anime industry. Well, you know what? That's one thing that really hasn't changed. There are still conventions. If the industry is as dead as we all are saying it is, where are all the fans coming from? Right? Yeah. Why are conventions still happening? So it's still there. We're just changing. We're morphing. The fans 
continue to change. They continue to skew younger. They continue to change more female. There tend to be little trends and patterns and things. Um, as of Nico, I started noticing the whole steampunk thing that's running on in anime. You know, there's the fusion. There's the mashup of the steampunk and the anime, and that's really cool. I don't personally feel the urge to put on a corset and go out and, and, and dress like that, but I think it's cool that other people do, and I think that after they do that, they'll want to do something else and something else and something else. And as long as people stay interested in it and wanting to come to the conventions and meet with each other, that's a really good thing. I was in a cab last night, and the guy asked me if I knew anything about like, the weird kids <laughs> at the what's hotel. What's going on? <laughs> and I told him a little bit, and he says, well, d why do you want to do this? And I said, well, to be together. Oh, to uh, enjoy. I said, yes, to enjoy. So that's what it is. We come together as fans, and we joy enjoy each other. And we go back into what our whatever normal lives are, and then we come back together again and be fans again. And I think that as long as we can come together and continue being fans, then that's what's going to keep the fandom alive. As far as OhioCon, um, the panel certainly has been very interesting. I've <laughs> never participated in a roast before, and I did that last night for Emily to Jesus, <laughs> and <laughs> that was among one of the most entertaining nights of my life. I have to say, it was unlike anything I've ever done before. I know Toshi's been both a member of roasts and a roastee on occasion, uh, so his experience of it is different than mine. But it was really fun for me today. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any way that we can keep up with you online and? see what you're up to? <laughs> I don't know about that. I, I uh, have a Facebook account, of course, and I have a, a Twitter feed, but I don't really, I'm not working on anything currently anime manga. I mean, I do from time to time, but I, I'm not at the moment. So anything that I would put on there is not necessarily going to be me talking about anime and manga. I'm usually talking about playing Dead Island or something. So <laughs> <laughs> I got the game the first day that it came out, and I put off playing it, and you know, I love zombies, zombie apocalypse, right? So I had to get it. I've never played on the Xbox before. I was afraid that I'd get laughed at, and and I opened up the game. I played it for 20 hours straight. 20 hours straight. I stood up. I almost passed out. My hands, I kept looking like this, like the controls. <laughs> I kept getting the force 3D thing. Um, I ended up talking all night to like 8-year-olds and 10-year-olds. 10-year-olds. <laughs> they would give me the modded weapons, and I would go around in their party, and they taught me how to do it. And there was a lesson in humility. You know, kids would say to me, why are you a girl? <laughs> I'd say, why are you 10? <laughs> so maybe there still is that big you know, people who are going on Xbox Live tend to be young men of a certain age. Yeah. But come on, you know, as soon as I would say that I'm a mom, suddenly the language would drop off. Suddenly they'd start being nicer, and they, they were nice to me. The little kids were nice to me, the 10-year-olds. Um, maybe Xbox Live fandom has as far to go in terms of the demographic expanding as anime has over the years. Maybe we'll see that. I mean, why can't I? Why can't I? I was just reading the other day online about this woman, the 70 year old woman who's like in, gosh, I hope I get it right, it was in World Warcraft or something. I think she's in World of Warcraft. Oh, yeah. She was, I think I saw her, was she the grandma that was like sitting playing Skyrim? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's Skyrim mom. She's got a yeah. tweet feed. She's oh, a different one. Yeah. <laughs> this woman is in World of Warcraft and she's 70 and she says, well, you know, I do this guild and blah, 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 and we all get together and she says, I'm not the oldest person playing it. However, that would be my husband. He's 72. Yeah, so, you know, I think gaming offers just as much for everybody. Yeah. It's just still very gender segregated, maybe the way that anime was once. So yeah. maybe there's something for gaming. Well. Yep. All right. Are there uh, any uh, final words that you have to say? Anything that you want to tell the people who are watching? Mm, I guess I'd have to echo again what, what my husband Toshi Yoshida was saying about um, supporting what it is that you love. And I certainly would not be saying fans need to go out and buy 10 copies of their favorite CD. I mean, I don't know how reasonable that is. But at the same time, if you've listened to what I've said, if, if any of it has resonated with you, remember the Borders anecdote. If I really wanted Borders to still be open, I would not be going in there and just getting the Kindle versions of it, you know? I made a choice, and um, it's different now. Would I do it again? Probably I would do it exactly the same way that I did. Anime fandom is where it is now because of the choices we all have made collectively as fans. If we want to keep it this way, we have to make some choices. If we want it to change, we'll make other choices. It's going to change whether we want it to change or not. We might have some input in it if we're lucky, or we might not, and then our role is to adapt to it. But if you love it, if you want to keep it the way it is, um, keep that in mind when you make your choices. Yeah. All right. Trish Ledoux, everyone, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>